So can I do this down? Okay, nice. So a little bit of uh, a little bit about our speaker today, Mohammad Abdul Razaghi received a BSc, BSc degree from the Iran University of Science and Technology, Tehran, in 2009, an MSc degree from the University of Alberta, Edmonton, Canada, in 2017, all in electrical and computer engineering. He then became involved as a research assistant of microwave and millimeter wave lab, M2M, at the University of Alberta and electromagnetics lead uh, at the Phase Advanced Sensors Corporation in Edmonton, Alberta. He joined the University of Toronto community in 2020 as a PhD student in the electrical and computer engineering department. His research interests include analog cir circuit in design RF circuits and microwave active sensors, machine learning, wireless power transfer, and phased arrays. He was awarded Alberta Innovates Technology Futures, AITF, a scholarship from University of Tra Alberta, 2015, got the first place in for CMC Microsystems um, National Research Council Industrial Collaboration Award in, also in 2015, an Ontario Graduate Scholarship in 2021. So uh, I know that we have an expert on this topic in the house, so we are very excited to hear uh, your talk on it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Perina, for your generous introduction. Um, hi, everyone. This is Mohamed Abdelrazavi. I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto. Um, I'm honored, actually, to present uh, my research review at the University of Alberta uh, while I was doing my master's on advances in microwave planner sensors using uh, active circuitry. So uh, the outline is I'll go through the microwave sensors topic briefly uh, as a background. I'll talk about the challenges in microwave sensing, uh, especially for passive sensors, uh, starting with the sensitivity and the quality factor and also the susceptibility to environment. I will uh, express our proposed solutions for them, including the passive sensors and active sensors. And also I'll go over the machine learning capabilities that are embedded in our sensors. And uh, I will end the talk with our conclusion. So uh, sensors, um, we are living in a world that actually there is no way we would do away from the environment. We need to have enough information about what is changing in the environment and what is happening, including uh, the pollution or the food that we are consuming or the uh, bacteria and viruses we're living with or the security of the products that we uh, are dealing with in everyday life. So sensors are means or devices that enable gathering information from the environment uh, so that it would help us sleep better. But why microwave sensors? Uh, starting with the uh, basic concept of the microwave sensors, uh, they, they are essentially metallic objects that start radiating and receiving electromagnetic powers into the free space. And because of the very feature of propagation of electromagnetic waves into the free space, they are able to interact and interrogate material under test around them. And this makes them suitable for uh, quite varied applications that bring about non-contact sensing. And uh, non-contact sensing or non-invasive method of sensing uh, enables very ap uh, many applications, including uh, food quality monitoring or uh, wearable sensors into uh, understanding the deep layers of these health signals or even understanding the deeper layers of a multi-layered structure are all um, able to be applicable with uh, non-invasive sensors. Also, this very feature increases their lifestyle, lifetime because they don't uh, have a direct contact with the material under test. So, and also they increase, reduce the maintenance cost and increase lifestyle, lifetime and durability. These are all the benefits of uh, microwave sensors. But we have a couple of challenges in uh, using the conventional microwave sensors. Uh, there are numerous microwave planner sensors out in the uh, literature that you, you can see a couple of them on the right. Uh, the, the main core of all of them is either SRRs or splitting resonators, as you can see in the bottom right figures, or complementary SRRs as uh, shown on the top right figure. Uh, but the main, and the way that they interact or interrogate the medium is uh, the gap that is sensitive to the environment 
and the electrical coupling with the material enables them to uh, gather information about the change in the environment. So the material under test is put in this gap and the, uh, the resonator is coupled with two transmission lines or one uh, and the transmission reflection profiles is being studied. As you can see, uh, the transmission profile undergoes a variation variation because of uh, a change in the uh, sensor's environment. Let's assume that there is a material with dielectric constant of 20. It shifts the resonance profile down. And also, if there is another material with a permittivity of 20 and a half, which is close to that, it also resides close to the previous profile. The challenge is that because of the low to moderate quality factor of these sensors, as you can see uh, from 30 up to 60 or even 100, uh, they are um, challenged by the fact that small variations in sensitive applications are quite difficult to be discerned. In this case, uh, the green and red graphs are quite difficult to be distinguished and separated from each other because the quality factor of the sensor is quite low. That's how uh, the conventional sensors are being designed. But there are two major uh, methods and solutions that we are going to propose in this talk. And uh, one is going to be the increasing in the sensitivity of the sensor. And also the second one is how the sensor can be more uh, high resolution such that these graphs could be separable from each other. So these two methods are going to be explained in the next few slides in both passive sensors and active sensors. So starting for, uh, with passive sensor concept, the normal and regular sensors are all made up of uh, a split ring resonator that is coupled to a pair of transmission lines. And as we just uh, mentioned, the quality factor of these designs are low to moderate. And also the sensitivities are mostly limited because of the internal coupling and internal capacitance of these SRRs such that the external materials uh, uh, a fraction with respect to the internal capacitance is negligible or small. So the sensor is not able to discern uh, sensitive variations in the environment. Uh, what we have uh, thought about the sensor is if we consider the resonator and the gap as two different sectors that are coupled uh, as shown in the top right graph and the coupling capacitors beside the resonator connecting them to the input and output port, uh, what we have found is that if for a given C gap and also the material under test and the resonator, if we change the coupling capacitor between the input and output ports and the sensor, uh, we can see actually two distinct uh, phenomena. Uh, the obvious one actually is the downshift in the resonance frequency of the whole structure because of the uh, high coupling uh, in, the, in the sensor being uh, sensing more of the environment. But the more is for the second phenomena that happens uh, for the sensitivity of the sensor. We can um, verify it in both simulation and analytical uh, expressions that with higher CC over C gap, the sensitivity of the sensor is increased significantly. And this enables higher uh, sensitive sensor for various applications. In this regard, we have made use of metamaterial-based uh, transmission lines instead of normal transmission lines uh, to couple the resonator to the input and output uh, of the sensor. Therefore, with a rigorous analysis that has been given actually in this paper, we could find out that the conventional transmission line when it's being used in the sensor can produce these graphs uh, when the permittivity of the material under test is going to change from um, 1 to 30. However, when we replace the normal um, microstrip line with metamaterial based microstrip line, we can see an increased sensitivity uh, of the sensor with for the known resonator and the known permittivity variations. And the metamaterial resonator, uh, metamaterial transmission line is made up of uh, including a series capacitance and also parallel inductance to the one of the uh, transmission lines, which is going to couple to the resonator uh, in the input and another transmission line in the output that is going to be coupled uh, to the resonator. This behavior brings about a coupling region uh, that's uh, in the dispersion diagram that this resonator can be designed within that region. And this brings about a high 
uh, coupling between the resonator and the transmission lines coupled to that and hence a better sensitivity achieved out of this design. So the performance of this design is evaluated with a prototype that is shown on the bottom left. Uh, once the sensor is exposed to material under test within a tube on top of that, and um, various liquids are being injected inside the tube, uh, we can see that uh, the, dielectric, the various dielectric constants of the material bringing about various uh, resonance frequencies of the sensor. And comparing the delta F or the absolute value of the frequency change versus the uh, dielectric property of the liquid shows a significant improvement of the proposed metamaterial based sensor with respect to the normal meta um, microstrip based sensor. And also in another experiment, we have shown that uh, for various concentrations of ethanol and methanol in water, when various uh, small but and very uh, minute concentrations of around 50 ppm, uh, wood increments of 50 ppm is being injected inside the, uh, the very tube on top of the sensor, we can see significant variations for the metamaterial based sensor compared with normal sensor that um, is hardly going to, uh, to uh, show any response at very high concentrations of materials. This shows how the sensitivity of the sensor can be improved for low variations of analytes inside a host medium. Uh, going forward for uh, mechanical type of sensors beside the material characterization based sensors, uh, a typical resonator uh, for mechanical sensitivity is shown on the uh, left side. As you can see, a two concentric split ring resonators are coupled with input and output resonator uh, transmission line. And the circuit diagram for that is shown in, uh, below the graph, where a parallel C and L is coupled to a transmission line with, with coupling capacitor. Uh, a rigorous analysis of this circuit ele elements is given at, in uh, reference two, and a high agreement between the circuit and ADS uh, simulation results is achieved uh, out of analyzing this uh, sensor. However, uh, we were trying to find out that how we can make use of this resonator as a mechanical sensor. With mechanical sensing, we mean uh, how we can discern the variations in the uh, displacement or rotation or uh, vertical displacement of, this, uh, of one of the mechanical elements or a stretch of an element uh, using microwave sensors. In order to do that, we came up with an idea of coupling another pair of split ring resonators on top of the original resonator, such that the, the second uh, DSRR is going to be stacked fully with respect to the original sensor. And the level of the, uh, the uh, and the way that the second pair is going to couple with the original sensor is going to determine the resonance frequency. So any kind of disturbance uh, with respect to the second tag or uh, second DSRR with respect to the original DSRR, it's going to bring about a change in the resonance frequency. Uh, we have studied it in four different categories, uh, starting with the vertical separation here. As you can see here, the first original uh, DSRR is going to be separated uh, with respect to another uh, tag DSRR, and the, the vertical distance is going to vary from about 100 micrometers up to one millimeters. And you can see that uh, a, a nonlinear variation indeed is going to uh, turn out because the propagation of EM waves into free space is not linear. Uh, however, for this very small variations of 0.1 millimeter up to one millimeter, we can see that a wide range of frequencies are going to change from four and a half gigahertz down to two and a half gigahertz. All in all, uh, for even very small, uh, vertical separations around 100 micrometers, we can see that a sensitivity of about 10 or 9 megahertz per micrometer could be achieved. In another example, we've shown that for if the rotation of the second stacked DSRR with respect to the original DSRR is going to be analyzed, 
uh, one can have different resonance frequencies starting from zero uh, degree with respect to the gaps or gaps location uh, or the gap of the original VSRR and the gap of the tag VSRR uh, and so rotating the gap location with, with 45 degrees uh, or 90 degrees bring about di different uh, levels of electric field concentrations uh, within the two uh, stacked uh, DSRRs. And that brings about a pseudo-linear variation in the sensor response for almost a wide range of uh, skew degrees from minus 180 degrees up to plus 180 degrees. Uh, and another two examples are we have tried the lateral separation where the tag is sitting on the original sensor, but only a lateral displacement is uh, allowed. And also the stretch of the tag with respect to the original sensor shows a pseudo-linear graphs for these uh, displacements. So we, we could enable uh, highly sensitive displacement sensors with the help of, again, coupling uh, two DSRRs on top of each other, similar to the previous uh, passive sensor where we have used the coupling between the DSRR and transmission line. Moving forward, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of information about the active sensors that we have come up, starting with the regenerative amplifiers. So uh, the normal SRRs that are being uh, used as the core of microbit planner sensors are giving us a low to moderate quality factors, as you can see in the right graph with a dark blue, uh, with dark color. However, this may not be quite feasible and uh, applicable in sensitive applications. Therefore, we needed to increase the quality factor of this sensor so that it could uh, it could compensate for some of the losses brought about the external loading of the input and output or the losses of the material. This is another way of improving the sensor's functionality with respect to a normal SRR, such that if the resolution of the sensor could be increased, we can also make use of this sensor in highly sensitive applications. Therefore, uh, imagine that we can, if we could take a sample of the uh, rotating or resonating signal inside the SRR and then amplify it and then return it back to the resonator with proper phase, then all we can have a compensation of the losses incurred in the resonator. This is shown in the bottom graphs where we have various uh, negative resistances. Uh, we can have a higher level of electromagnetic wave propagation into the surrounding area, including the free space ahead of the sensor. This has been achieved with uh, a regenerative amplifier uh, with proper phase compensation using the static uh, transmission lines coupled to the resonator. The main point uh, is also revealed here. Just imagine how small variations in the material under test could result in these low quality factor uh, transmission responses. Imagine that how small the transmission amplitude is uh, within this range of about two megahertz uh, that is offset with respect to the resonance frequency and how, uh, how difficult it will be for a measurement device to discern the differences between these two. So the idea is to couple a loss compensation device so that it could cover the lost power in the sensor and it could sharply elaborate the final transmission responses. Again, the variation in the environment is not going to change the sensor response. The one megahertz that we were expecting at first is also going to be repeated in the second case. So the sensitivity is not uh, modified in this case, but the only thing that has been achieved is the high quality factor for the uh, proposed sensor. In this case, uh, as any type of microwave uh, resonator, uh, can be applied to within this diagram so that uh, two main conditions need to be met. First, the phase that the uh, loss compensating element or the amplifier is going to in, in, uh, <clears throat> embed into the device is going to be added with the phases of the external transmission lines and the uh, composition of these phases are going to be uh, an even multiplication, a multiple of pi. 
so that the phase being returned back to the resonator would be uh, in constructive mode. And the second case is if we look at the circuit diagram of, or the parallel RLC circuit model of the resonator, uh, the yellow box shows the normal passive resonator with CL and also conductance GI or the internal conductance, uh, coupled with the external uh, GE or the input output or the G of MUT. The only difference that the active resonator is going to bring about is to add an extra parallel negative resistance because of the uh, loss compensating element or the amplifier that we are using here. And with proper manipulating or controlling this negative resistance, we can achieve uh, high quality factors where only part of the losses are going to be compensated. If full loss compensation is achieved, then uh, beside the actor resonator behavior, we can have an oscillation behavior as well. It may be wanted or uh, disregarded in, depending on the applications. But for now, we are going to make use of the actor resonator mode where uh, the devices under study are not going to resonate or uh, are not going to oscillate. For oil sand, uh, applications. So for instance, so this the proposed sensor is being used to, to show its capability. Uh, in this design, the active resonator is going to be exposed to the materials, which is going to flow within a PTFE tube on top of the resonator. And the material over here is the oil sample, including asphalt in itself. And in oil sand industry, it is really important to find out where is the or when is the onset of precipitation of asphaltine uh, within the oil uh, uh, tubes or reservoirs because, because of the uh, precipitation of asphaltine, there may be a, a clogging in the tubes or the reservoir and there will be enhanced maintenance costs. So if one could predict when it's going to start, uh, when the precipitation of the asphaltine is going to start because of a rapid change in the temperature or pressure, uh, one can uh, uh, do precautionary efforts to stop the uh, extra expenses. In this regard, we have simulated what can happen in that case using uh, a precipitant element. So we have you injected uh, an oil sample, uh, and also we have uh, injected a, a plug of uh, precipitant element as n heptane to that, and the connection of these two liquids inside this tube uh, causes the asphaltine within the oil sample to precipitate. And as you can see here in the graph, this uh, precipitation is going to happen gradually over time where our sensor is going to capture the variations over time. And the graphs, uh, you can see that uh, small nanoparticles of asphaltine has been extracted from the oil sample uh, when the a precipitating uh, and heptane is going to wash it away or, and uh, flow over that, but part of that, those particles are remaining on uh, the sensing spot. And the variations over time uh, for the 1.25% of, of oil with and heptane can be quite captured uh, with the proposed design. These are very small variations in the dietary constant of oil sample indeed that is only able to be uh, discerned with uh, extremely high quality factors achieved by the active sensor. So I'm going to skip these two slides for the benefit of our time. Uh, keep going on the uh, loss compensation of the designs. Uh, the regenerative amplifier design is similar is similarly repeated here. Uh, with a difference, in fact, in the phase compensation apparatus. So uh, the whole idea is to first compensate the loss uh, in terms of the magnitude of the uh, transmission loss that is achieved with because of the resonator uh, using this amplifier. And also the second uh, criteria is to compensate for the phase. So initially we had used constantly uh, in static uh, transmission lines as the phase compensating elements. But at this time, we have used very uh, the reactor in order to create different phases uh, in, uh, that increases the functionality of the sensor for various kind of 
uh, environments or various loss, uh, various lossy materials. Over here, it is shown that various uh, the reactor's value is going to change only the uh, the phase of this transmission profile, but not going to change that much on the resonance frequency. So we are expecting to have a configurable phase in the design so that it can be uh, fully compensated at the frequency of operation. In this case, uh, the frequency of operation is set to around 5 gigahertz uh, because of the high sensitivity of higher frequencies. And uh, the, phase, the corresponding phase noise of this oscillator is measured as follows. An application of the proposed uh, oscillator design that is an easier uh, design compared to a two-port uh, two regenerative amplifier because it only makes use of a single port and it can be analyzed with a BSA rather than DNA, uh, which uses less computation. In this design, we have tested our sensor uh, in humidity sensing environments. Two uh, masculine controllers that are used to control the uh, flow of the air inside uh, the, the flow box, uh, inside the sensor box. But in, one of, in front of one of them, there is a bubbler that is going to create uh, various concentrations of humidity inside the sensor box. The commercial sensor is already being used to monitor the relative humidity while we are changing uh, the, air, the flow rate of the air. Uh, the results shown on the top right graph shows how the sensor response is going to follow exactly the sensor, the commercial sensor's response. And also uh, there is a linear uh, variation in the oscillation frequency with respect to the relative humidity as shown in the bottom right. The relative humidity is uh, while changing from 5% to about 65% are shown to have a uh, high sensitivity of about 833 kilohertz per percent in this design. We, in order to uh, enable this high sensitivity, we have used uh, a polyaniline polymer uh, in the sensitive region of the sensor, such that because of the absorption of humidity, it becomes lossy and a standard constant also changes. That's how the sensor uh, operates uh, at this frequency. Moving forward, we have come to the idea of increasing the stability of the uh, oscillators in frequency and also in time-based measurements. So looking at the phase noise of the uh, of familiar phase noise equation, uh, there are a couple of factors that, that could be used to reduce the phase noise of the uh, uh, prevalent sensor. And one is to make use of uh, lower temperature or uh, the higher output uh, power uh, or the quality factor increase. So between these, we have chosen the latter as the quality factor increase has already been uh, implemented in our previous designs, uh, as we've uh, shown in the previous slides. So in this design, we are going to make use of the core SRR and coupling it with a negative resistance circuit to compensate its loss we can have uh, a standalone oscillator. Part one and part two of this graph uh, is shown to be standalone oscillator. However, if you can somehow increase the quality factor of this SRR, then we would have much better phase noise. And that's how the second uh, active sensor is going to come into play as part three, which is a negative resist, uh, a feedback uh, amplifier or a regenerative amplifier, which is going to increase the quality factor of the sensor of the SRR only. In this case, uh, the spectrum of the sensor is also compared when the active tank is used uh, with respect to the passive tank. So with active tank, we mean that this part three, which is an additive section, is not being triggered. And only the core SRR's resonator is being used. Uh, and you can see that how of uh, narrower this spectrum has become because of me keep, uh, keep using the uh, loss compensation for only the SRR. So here we have made use of this sensor again uh, in the liquid characterization. We have created uh, various concentrations of uh, water and ethanol as you can see here uh, and injected into the sensor 
uh, with controlled relative humidity and temperature. And we, uh, according to a time-based measurement, various concentrations of uh, water in ethanol uh, can be distinguished uh, with relatively high concentrations of 20%, 30%, 40%. But when it comes to lower concentrations, it all uh, boils down to the instability of the sensor response in time uh, that the output of the spectrum is not going to be very stable. That's how uh, this scrambled graph is being created at the uh, lower concentrations of uh, water in ethanol. However, when we activated the active filter instead of passive filter, you can see that how confined and uh, robust the output of the sensor has become. And uh, the sensor is going to show much uh, uh, more stable uh, output response uh, in this case, such that it allows for uh, measuring even smaller concentrations of water in ethanol. Uh, in this case, we could reduce the uh, concentrations of from 7% of the limit of detection for the passive filter down to 0.5% uh, for active filter. In this case, uh, you can see that the water content uh, is going to change at lower uh, percentages and the variation of the sensor output with respect to the, uh, one of the uh, frequencies, for instance, ethanol as a reference is shown here. It shows that how uh, changing the output of the uh, sensor is when the passive, uh, passive filter is being used and it doesn't allow us for going below this uh, gray region. However, when we are activating the active filter, this uh, smaller or narrower line is achieved where the air bar is going to confine this region a lot uh, smaller compared to the original case. So that the variation in the output when there is no change uh, in the is going to reduce from about 35 or 40 kilohertz down to about two to three kilohertz. And also the corresponding phase noise is also showing uh, and a huge improvement in the response for both measurement and analytical responses of about 13 dB per hertz uh, when we are changing the filter from passive mode into an active mode. So moving forward, uh, we have started thinking about how we can also increase the sensitivity of the uh, oscillator. So intermodulating a two individual signals of F1 and F2 in a nonlinear device can bring about uh, harmonic components and also intermodulating components. However, these intermodulating components are and may have not found quite interest in communication because nobody wants interference when they are sending or receiving their P or F1 or F2 signals. However, we tried to redefine this concept in sensing applications and we thought that if, for instance, uh, F1 and F2 are uh, denoting two different res resonator or sensors, and because of any variation in environment, there could be a delta F uh, on the F1, how, while F2 has not been changed. So normally, one could achieve a delta F in their sensor response. However, when we are using intermodulation products, the third intermodulating product, just because of this delta F, in the uh, in F1 is going to change by twice uh, as delta F, and the fifth intermodulation product is going to change by three times, and seventh intermodulation by four times. So indeed, we could uh, arbitrarily increase the sensitivity uh, when we are using the intermodulation products. So we, starting with the simplest design, we try to implement the second or the second active resonator. Uh, stage and input that with a signal generator and variations in the output power is shown in the bottom right as with the empty tube uh, the black curve is going to shift down to a blue one because of the water injection inside the tube passing through the resonator however uh, third in the modulation product is going to shift down twice that magnitude so uh, in this design, the input frequency that is from coming from a signal generator hasn't changed. 
but the resonator or the sensor's signal resonance frequency is going to change because of the material and the corresponding intermodulation products uh, are going to change as well. In the next design, uh, we have incorporated the first sector also from a microwave oscillator. So we replaced the previously uh, used signal generator with uh, a local signal generator so that F1 and F2 are being generated with respect to um, similar oscillator designs. And again, uh, keeping F2 as constant, uh, which, uh, which is responsible for this part of the graph uh, design, but changing F1, or we could also do it interchangeably, F keeping F1 constant and changing F2. But it's, in this case, F1 is used because it's in lower frequency. It uh, brings about change in the uh, intermodulation products by two times, as you can see here, and uh, three times and four times here. Also, uh, there might be a question on the stability of the uh, individual frequencies, F1 and F2, and also intermodulation products versus time. And you can see that we can modify uh, the sensor response such that the output uh, response is not going to show uh, significantly degraded uh, instability in time when the intermodulation, higher order intermodulation products are going to be used. And also here, uh, reduced phase noise because of making use of uh, intermodulation product or even not changing significantly uh, of the phase noise is obvious, uh, which uh, represents that uh, intermodulation products are going to bring about almost the same stability as the original uh, frequencies. So here we've used the IMS sensor uh, for three applications, uh, starting with the MUT sensing. As you can see here, the F, uh, the various concentrations, uh, various bulk materials of medium, uh, starting with water, acetone, methanol, ethanol, IPA, toluene, and C7 uh, can give th these variations for F1. However, uh, the third intermodulation product could show uh, double, the doubling the effect and fifth, uh, the tripling the effect, and also seventh intermodulation product the quadrupling the effect as shown below. It has also shown its improvement uh, in the sensing of glucose in water, uh, as shown here, and also oil precipitation that could be achieved for very small concentrations. So I'll skip uh, for the benefit of the time. Uh, and, uh, and here is an application of the um, proposed sensors in glucose sensing that I will skip some of the common points, uh, just mentioning the fact that we have made use of the SRR in a, a regenerative amplifier design to compensate for the losses of the environment, especially the glucose in water. Uh, and also we have tried to inject various concentrations of glucose from 100 millimole per liter up to 1,000 millimole per liter. Uh, and adjusting the bias voltage of the design, uh, we could achieve a very highly stable uh, sensor output and could, find, and could distinguish the variations of uh, the glucose inside uh, the tube very well. The linear sensitivity of the sensor with respect to various glucose levels is also shown below, and also distinct uh, S21 profiles for various uh, concentrations is also shown at the bottom uh, right graph. Also, wireless communication is an important concept which is going to evolve these days because of all of these sensors are going to be used in 5G uh, or Internet of Things platform, which needs to be communicated uh, with a central hub or the other adjacent sensors. That's how we thought that how we can make use of, uh, how we can enable wireless communication in our design. Uh, we make, with the help of a high gain wide band antenna uh, as the wireless link rather than just a cable, and uh, the set resonator is connected to the network analyzer uh, for just a demonstration of how we can make use of uh, the wireless communication. And in the graph uh, at the bottom right, it is shown that the red curve is for the passive sensor where there hasn't been any loss compensation. Uh, 
and the resonance profile is quite killed because of the path loss. However, uh, the active resonator, because of its loss compensating mechanism, could still convey the resonance frequency at the uh, frequency of interest to the second port. This has been evaluated with a pair of uh, high gain wide band antennas for transmitter and also for receiver, which are linearly polarized to uh, prevent the uh, interference. And then we can show that bulk medium could be quite distinctly separated from each other when we are using uh, the active sensor. Also, we have uh, used a lossy saline wall uh, between the two pairs of the transmitter and receiving antennae. And we could see that with various concentrations of, say, uh, uh, saline in the water, we could have still uh, quite decent transmission of the uh, pro pro transmission of the tra sensor profile to the second port. So that's how uh, this application could be enabled with only use of uh, active resonator. So uh, the last topic uh, with machine learning, um, I will skip the first two slides and we'll start from here. So. The concept of planar microwave sensor is coming uh, is tightly linked with the propagation of EM waves into the free space. And that by itself is going to make it susceptible to the environmental change, such that any type of variation, which might be unwanted, uh, are, is going to affect the sensor response. For instance, any tem temperature variation or humidity change in the environment is going to change uh, the effective data constant of either the substrate or the material inside the tube. Uh, and also the sensor response is going to uh, scramble such that uh, there wouldn't be a proper prediction of what material is inside the tube. However, we are going to show how machine learning is enabling us to uh, properly uh, classify different materials. In this case, we are just showing that how uh, the sensor response undergoes change when there is a heating uh, happening inside the sensing box. So this sensor is inside, inside the sensing box, which is fully sealed uh, with a commercial temperature and sensor uh, monitoring the environment. And because of the heat source, the uh, temperature of the environment is going to increase. And because of that, the dielectric constant of the media of the uh, medium including uh, the substrate and the material inside the tube are, are going to change. That's uh, resulting in the change in the resonance frequency of the sensor. In this case, various uh, materials such as acetone or methanol or water are used and you can see that how the resonance frequency undergoes a variation because of uh, heat cycles, which is a uh, repeatable indeed. However, uh, the, the fact comes of, uh, it is from the uh, fact that the dielectric constant of the medium undergo a change because of the temperature. And you can see uh, the extracted versions for water, acetone, and methanol for a wide range of temperatures uh, show a decrease in the dielectric constant and increase in the uh, loss tangent of the corresponding medium uh, are going to affect the sensor response. As a result, uh, if you assume that various concentrations of different uh, mixtures are going to be studied, for instance, acetone and uh, methanol in water, um, you can see that blue curves are showing uh, the trends only for methanol concentrations in waters, starting with 20% up to 100% with 20% increments. And the red curves show those for acetone. However, a uh, wide range of dielectric constant change causes these graphs to uh, be intermingled such that if one needs to find out what the material is inside of the tube, only looking at the, uh, with only looking at the frequency of operation, there would be a quiet confusion that which graph uh, or which material at what temperature uh, we are uh, experiencing. That's how we devised uh, machine learning uh, two-step method such that we could find out exactly what material is inside the tube and what temperature it is experiencing. It is uh, composed of two sections. First, uh, we have tried different uh, liquids or different solutions of uh, methanol and ethanol and water uh, with 20% increments, uh, which 
uh, counts up to 10 different materials. And we have the sensor undergoing a, a similar temperature cycle for all of those 10 uh, materials. And we have gathered the S21 profiles, uh, which had 500, 5,001 points of, for each profile. Uh, and, and the machine learning algorithm is fed with all of them such that uh, uh, the, the first part of this machine learning technique is to just classify which material we are dealing with. So with various S21 profiles being fed to machine learning, uh, to, uh, to we could find what material is there. And the second part is once uh, from a pool of different materials and different concentrations, uh, we could identify that what if it is methanol in water, for instance, with 20% or ethanol in water with 40%, then the second part comes into play, which is a customized uh, regression for each material. So we have uh, used the same change in the sensor response in this section, uh, but this time we have classified and we have uh, narrowed it down into a single material. Since the material is already known in the first section, the second part is only considering that specific material under test. So for each material, we have a linear change in the sensor's response with respect to the temperature. And the combination of these two uh, gives us a highly successful classification of the uh, materials, as well as finding out the uh, temperature of the uh, sensor. So here are the references. In conclusion of this talk, uh, ultra high sensitive passive sensors are achieved with increasing coupling for both material characterization and mechanical displacement sensing. Uh, active sensors are devised to improve quality factor in sensitive measurements. Regenerative mm -hmm. amplifiers are used to partially compensate the lost power. Full compensation is obtained using microwave oscillator designs. Uh, the oscillator phase noise has been reduced using active filter. Uh, sensitivity of material characterization is increased arbitrarily with exploiting intermodulation products. Uh, wireless communication is enabled with active sensors and robustness of planar sensors uh, is increased with machine learning algorithms. Thank you for your time. And that was my uh, talk that was probably over time. Oh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, it's it was great. I'm just going to stop recording before sure, starting sure. the Q and A. Uh...